and Corroiso, welcome. We're continuing with the Languages of the World series, and we've gotten to the Middle East, a part of the world that I'm quite fond of, because my mother growing up, she had lived in Egypt and Kuwait, and we had bits around our house, artifacts, which aesthetically, very pleasing to me, is the Middle East. So let's look at these languages, but first, what do we mean by the Middle East? So look at this map. This is what I'm considering the Middle East for now. We'll do the Caucasian languages in another video and North Africa in another video and Central Asia and India. So don't worry, we'll get there. Now, explaining these in one sentence, these languages take it with a pinch of salt, yeah? I can't compress thousands of years into one sentence without annoying somebody. So let's get started. Of course, I save Hebrew for the end. Turkish is a Central Asian mountain folk turned horse warrior language who learned to read through Persian and Arabic, who assimilated Greeks who forgot that they were Hittites with French sprinkles. Cypriot Greek is medieval 12th century Byzantine Koine Greek with Crusader Norman French and dashes of Italian languages with Turkish delights. Kurdish is an arch of three closely related Indo-Iranian languages trapped inside of a vicious love triangle between Arabic, Turkish, and Persian, playing each of them off of each other to survive with Aramaic sprinkles, Zaza. Can we just appreciate for a moment there is a language called Zaza. Zaza, whose speakers also call it Dimli, originated on the South Caspian coast in present-day Iran, an Indo-Iranian language, whose speakers migrated long ago over the mountains and into Turkey where they became the best friends of Kurds their cousins, linguistically. Today, heavily diluted by Turkish. Luri is the language that Persian speakers think they speak but don't, because Luri is actually the most closely related language to the Persian of the old Achaemenid Empire, the first Persian Empire, with Kurdish sprinkles. Farsi, or Persian, is the language that won the race to be the first to have a majority on the Iranian plateau, the high ground, nice, between Pashto and Kurdish on the Indo-Iranian spectrum with gluing grammar, mutant powers taken from Turkic languages with about 25% from Arabic, loanwords of snobbery and Mongolian sprinkles. Gilaki is spoken by a Caspian seacoast Iranian people who almost became Caucasian speakers under their influence, like the Georgian language, not my skin, with consonants that are the same as Persian but vowels, which are different, and Turkic sprinkles. Manzindarani is very close to Gilaki, but less Caucasian influence and they kept more of the ancient Indo-European words, which were lost in Persian and other Iranian languages. With Iranian sprinkles and mountain hermits, you might say. Kashkai is a Central Asian Turkic language of a people who Genghis Khan's grandson got to burn down Baghdad for him. And rather than bring them all the way back to Central Asia, he just left them in Central Southwest Iran and said, well, you're on your own, guys. With Arabic, Persian, and Mongolian sprinkles. Aramaic is... Aramaic is the language of Jesus, but instead of dying and coming back to life, like Hebrew did, it split up into four shrinking groups, which people have argued over for centuries about them being dialects or distinct languages themselves, and they can't 
make up their mind with vestiges of Koine Greek and, by this point, Arabic and Kurdish sprinkles. Right, Arabic. There's the spoken variety and the literary variety and the historical continuum. I'm focusing on the literary language, or rather Arabic generally. If you want a video covering the variation within the Arabic dialect continuum, let me know. But for now, subscribe. Arabic is what happens when a man emerges from a cave, claiming to have conversations with an angel. And these conversations were written down in the language which is then banned from ever being changed. And then his followers spreading that conversation over the earth. And as they kill languages, those speakers of Arabic then change Arabic in each region that it's spoken in. From underneath. With Persian and Aramaic sprinkles. Mahri is if the Arabian Peninsula was covered in a forest of languages and then a, a wide flood swept over it, drowning them all except for a small cluster of trees in the south, the far south. And of all these, only one of these, barely pushing above the water, had more than a hundred thousand speakers chattering in his language. With Amharic echoes from Ethiopia, Coptic is the ancient Afro-Asiatic Egyptian language mummified, kept on life support over centuries by slow dripping it, medieval Greek blood with Latin and Arabic sprinkles. Siwi is not seaweed. It is an Afro-Asiatic language spoken by a merger of lost Berbers and pre-Arabic Copts in a beautiful oasis surrounded by Arabs influenced with Egyptian and Bedouin Arabic sprinkles. Hebrew is the only language to have ever come back to life. Truly, truly. And Hebrew is. Hebrew is the language of Moses, of Abraham, of prophets later. It is the bedrock of Christianity and Islam, which would then go on to create renaissances in Europe and the Middle East. It is the foundation of our ethics, our morality, and it is the language which the ideas of forgiveness come from. Hebrew is slowly becoming my fourth language. I thought it would be Dutch. It's very closely related to Arabic. Sprinkles from Yiddish, German, Aramaic, and a whole host of other languages it used to resurrect itself. Hebrew is the language of my name, Benjamin. Hebrew is the language of my mother and father's names, both, and the names of so many kings and queens, and the colleges of Cambridge, where I went to echo their names too, in places. Hebrew is the smallest language in the world with the greatest impact. What a beautiful story is Hebrew. Thank you very much for watching, and a special thanks to my Patreons on the screen now.